much. This will be a short paper about uh, distinction that we use uh, in our discussion on evil God, so uh, mainly about the primary and secondary causation in the case of the Odyssey. Uh, so th this is the goal of our presentation, um, to uh, evaluate the classical answer to the question of God's action in nature that distinguish God as primary cause and creatures as secondary causes. And these concepts are relevant to, to the issue of attributing evil to God or his possible responsibility for evil in nature. Uh, our, our paper prepared together with uh, Tomasz Huzarek, we will divide into parts. I will briefly summarize the Aquinas approach to God's action in nature and Tomasz will share opinions about this model that we found in contemporary uh, studies. So advantages and disadvantages of uh, maintaining this distinction uh, on uh, dual causality. In many recent debates, there are many references to the classical model of this dual causality, and this model seems to make a substantial contribution to our understanding of God's action in the world, protecting us against any misconceived notion of God as cause among created causes, and thus against the temptation of adopting a God of the gaps view. At the same time, it has sometimes been challenged by, uh, for failing to provide an answer to question concerning God and his presence in the world. To what extent can this model uh, be useful in theodicy? Uh, especially in the context of questions about action of nature. So let, let me start with observation that St. Thomas often uses expressions such as, I quote, God himself working in nature, ipse deus in natura operans, or God works in the very working of nature, in ipsa operatione nature, operatur deus, or God is the cause of the entire good done by man. Deus est causa totius boni operis per homines facti. In many of Aquinas' statements, there is a conviction that God acts perfectly and intimately as the primary cause, since, I quote, the form of a thing is within the thing, and all the more, as it approaches nearer to the first and universal cause. And because in all things God himself is properly the cause of universal being, which is innermost in all things, it follows that in all things God works intimately. For this reason, in Holy Scripture, the operation of nature are attributed to God as operating in nature according to the Job 10, 11, Tu hast clothed me with skin and flesh, Tu hast put me together with bones. For that reason, Aquinas believes that the operation of nature takes place under the divine operation, by analogy with how a lower art acts under the control of a higher art. A lower art anticipates the attainment of an end which it itself is not capable of attaining without the action of a higher art that molds uh, things into form. From this, Thomas draws the conclusion that nature alone cannot attain what it itself desires and that it's therefore God who injects a purpose into nature and guides nature towards that purpose. So the image that Aquinas is using is the arrow. So without man, same arrow is not able to attain a goal. Since God is the cause of existence in all beings, he is closest to them and can act at their level. Therefore, in his description of God's action in nature, Thomas uses the expression that God is acting secundum virtutem, according to the power since uh, God is the first agent who enables the operation of secondary causes, and the whole activity of nature is attributed to divine power. 
The image used by Thomas is that of operation of nature where be a plant produces another plant. Even for this happens thanks to the power of the sun. Likewise, God is the cause and he is so directly by reason of the significance of that effect. Thus, it's possible to interpret Paul's statement that God inspire all works in everyone, the quotation from first letter to Corinthians uh, 12, 6, in the, in the sense, uh, in the above sense, rather than in occasionalist sense, which suggests that God replaces nature. It's God's will that constitutes the root of all natural movements. Therefore, there is no natural work except in God. This is quotation from Aquinas. In addition to, to this approach, Aquinas also considers God's action in nature from a number of other points of view. Just let me mention a few of them. One of them is that uh, God's work takes place in nature in a manner similar to the relationship between nature and art. Here the operation of art presupposes the operation of nature and it's through that operation that nature manifests itself. The example given by Thomas in De Potentia describes how fire softens the iron so that it can be formed in different stages, uh, shapes. The first cause operates through the action of secondary causes by analogy with the manner in which art operates thanks to nature. The former cannot function without the latter. What is more, it attempts to imitate it. In the same manner, secondary causes imitate the first cause. Another way in which the first cause operates is manifested in that fact that it excites nature to act. Which is why the action that results from such excitation is attributed to the first cause. Thomas uses the verb excitare and employs analogy which reflects the conviction of his time with regard to medicine, namely that nature itself cures illnesses and that the role of the medical doctor is to remove the obstacle that inhibit nature's action. Since the principles of life are found in nature, the role of any agents acting from without is to release nature's power. So the first cause operates by moving the secondary causes. Consequently, in the very operation of nature, the operation of divine power also takes place, I quote, just as the operation of an instrument is affected by the power of the principal agent. While the action of God as the first cause demands secondary causes, it may sometimes produce the same effect without uh, involving the secondary causes, but not perform in the way nature does. As for a sick man to be healed immediately uh, when one's hands are placed on him, for nature produces the same effect step by step, is the quotation from Aquinas. While such things are possible, as Thomas observed, God nevertheless uh, prefers to act by means of nature, mediante natura, so as to preserve order in things. The fact that God acts as the first cause, omitting secondary causes doesn't mean that order is ignored. This takes place with regard to a specific nature rather than nature as such. Preter naturam is, so following nature and uh, relying on nature is, as Aquinas said, the most characteristic manner of God's miraculous uh, activity. In this sense he is using the word miracle. However, this relationship between the first cause and secondary causes must not lead to us judging God's power through the lens of what a secondary cause can or cannot accomplish. Among the things that should only be judged in reference to direct divine action, Thomas mentions the creation of the world, the creation of the soul, 
and glorification of the soul. In this context, he also introduces the term divine superior cause, causa superior divina, and uh, intermediate secondary causes. As it emerges from the above description, the first cause doesn't compete with the secondary causes in its action. On the contrary, it's an intimate relationship that empowers secondary causes to act. While it normally operates through secondary causes, the first cause can also produce certain effects without the involvement of secondary causes. Such operation, however, is not an interventionist action that presupposes a prior absence. Instead, it's miraculous in character and as such involves a different manner of producing an outcome. In this sense, God, as the first cause, is said to be the cause of everything's action, inasmuch as he gives everything the power to act and preserves the power, that power in being, and applies it to action inasmuch as by his power every other causal power acts. And finally, in my part, I will refer to the famous quotation from Roman, uh, the, the Roman letter 822, uh, groaning in travail, uh, as to indicate the God's merciful action in, in uh, nature as well. Uh, among his attempts to explain the existence of physical evil, natural evil, in the context of original justice, St. Thomas also proposes eschatological perspective developed around Paul's view of creation uh, in this verse of uh, Roman letters. The first cause guides the entire created world towards an end that takes into account the nature of every being, groaning in travail, is meant to express something that is contrary to one's will. This refers to all creation, including heavenly bodies, and travail means turning towards renewal. The pain comes from the postponent of glory, rather than from evil as punishment alone. The reason for such postponent being the fact, I quote, that is necessary for us to suffer with Christ in order to reach the fellowship of his glory." End of quotation. This eschatological view allows Aquinas to understand the perfection of the originally created world not in the absolute sense, at omnia individua, but with respect to a particular stage. And this is very familiar to Irenaeus' view that Michal has shown us in his uh, lecture, because for Aquinas this Perfect stage is like the child, so the per child is perfect at this stage of his development. So, in this sense, the world at the beginning was perfect, not in absolute, absolute way. Still, uh, does the concept of the first cause and its importance to secondary causes not entail God's responsibility for the wrongdoings of created causes? We can ask. By introducing the distinction between potestas and voluntas, Aquinas explains how the first cause is present in evil deeds, in evil actions. The desire to heart comes from creation. We realize the power to heart, even if such action is detrimental to creation, comes from the first cause. God puts a limit on the will or desire to inflict harm, but he doesn't revoke the capacity to act, which is in itself good but can be deformed by creation. This is why God is said to permit harm rather than inflict it. For Aquinas, therefore, God is not the cause of any evil suffer. On the contrary, evil is a byproduct of the action of the good God. As Brian Davis notes, uh, I quote, God can make a word that contains no evil suffer, but God not, cannot make a material world such as ours without material agents interacting and causing damage to each other. End of quotation. In that manner, God is causally constrained as a result of distinction between potestas dei absoluta et potentia dei ordinata 
And this is not for Aquinas a weakness in God's omnipotence, but a consequence of God's prior free action, his love towards creation, where we, he chooses the path towards the end. So this is shortly uh, uh, the perspective that Aquinas is maintaining about this uh, distinction on first and secondary causes, and Tomasz will show you uh, some advantages and shortcomings of this distinction. Thank you so much. I prefer, I have prepared only three pictures, but uh, um, it shows us uh, this problem um, with uh, this relationship between the first cause and secondary causes uh, and some controversy. Uh, the first, uh, the advantages. The distinction between the first cause and secondary causes establishes a clear framework for the debate between God and creation. This distinction showing that God is not merely one of the many causes in the world. God does not content with created causes, but he is their ontologi ontological root. Second, uh, the relationship between the first cause and secondary causes is not physical, but metaphysical. This, the argument uh, got of the gap, is uh, undermined. This, is, uh, this argument is completely modern arg argument, which uh, did not appear among the scholastics. The next one, uh, this dual ca causality model is, uh, is not deistic, because uh, it presupposes an active presence of God an intimate and not competitive relationship between the first and secondary uh, causes. Uh, the dual causality model makes easier the, uh, to grasp uh, the rectitude of the state of original justice versus sin. In this model, in the stage of original justice, natural processes relied on the correct at the um, uh, or the subordination of secondary causes with the first cause uh, as a way of bringing order to things. Furthermore, Davis uh, observes uh, that with God being the first cause, we cannot blame God for evil because he is not a moral subject. The perception that the first cause acts in the same terms as created causes brings with itself the temptation to make moral judgment about God and to interpret his decision in the, ter in the such terms. And now uh, the reservations, the shortcomings Critics of the dual causality can be uh, divided into two groups. The first group concludes that metaphysical view of the relationship between the first and secondary causes says little, in a positive sense, about the nature of God's action in the world. What is essentially means to be the first cause? And about the, the personal life uh, of God. And as, uh, those in the second group focus their criticism of, uh, on the search for the causal joint and reference to God's transcendence, raising questions about the rash, uh, rationale for the use of analogy by uh, advocates of the dual causality model. This critic's argument is about using analogy in thinking about the first cause. Simon Kittel uh, notes that while the primary and secondary causation distinction may help us to understand, understand uh, how God could be intimately involved with every aspect of the unfolding creation, it provides not, no help in understanding how God might guide the um, unfolding of creation, nor nor how God could be responsive to creation. 
This Thomas distinction is not uh, conductive to a better understanding of the uh, in the, um, impl implementation of the divine purpose, which is important to the context of evolution. As Kittel argues, the extent of possible divine action changes uh, in the deterministic scenario, where God only changes uh, the initial conditions, whereas in an uh, indeterministic scenario, where appears a causal join in the form of a chancy event. But, however, this understanding result from the uh, identification of the first cause with one of the many causes in the world, limited by the freedom of uh, secondary causes. Another criticism of dual causality model is based on the conviction that it makes the operation of the primary cause redundant by arguing that everything can be explained by created causes. This problem stems not only from the very notion of cause, but also from the manner uh, in which one effect can be caused, caused by the causes in all fullness. However, a proper understanding of the Thomas model being a principle does not mean physically uh, controlling processes. Instead, it means acting in a manner that can be rejected by secondary causes, in which case uh, any resulting failure lures cannot be blamed on the primary cause. Therefore, God is not merely a carrier, as Clark and Kopersky put in, that is, someone who helps creation from without by clearing the path ahead, but rather God is someone who empowers creation to act. Thank you so much.